Welcome to the Avenue Church. My name is Casey, and I get to serve, thanks Matt, as one of your pastors. And I was about nine years old, best I can remember. And I came into my house after soccer practice. Uh, I was with my mom and little sister at the time. My dad was on a church trip in California that somehow included going to the Super Bowl. I, I, I don't know how that works. I want to sign up for that. Um, but that's where he was, and that's where we were. And as we entered into the house, you know, again, as best I can remember, I did what I normally did. I walked through the house, and by the time I got to my room, I noticed that something was different. In my room, I noticed that my screen had been um, moved out and was placed on my bed. Um, I didn't really know what that meant, and so I went and found my mom, and I said, hey, mom, um, l- l- the, the screen, it's kind of weird, but the screen is on my bed. Like, I don't really know what that means, but whatever. I, I know enough that you should probably know. And um, very quickly, uh, without me putting a lot together, I realized that my mom um, had suddenly begun to respond to an unseen threat. Um, we hurried into the car, uh, again, not putting <clears throat> two and two together. I just knew that now it seemed like adrenaline was, was pumping and I needed to get in the car quick. And so we got into the car with my little sister, we drove to my best friend's house, and we camped out there, and the story began to unfold later that somebody had broken into our house, and we don't know whether they happened to be there when we came home or not, but here's what my mom knew. There was an unseen threat that she needed to respond to immediately. There was an unseen threat that she needed to respond to immediately. So first of all, yay, mom, you're awesome, because I know mom's here. Where are you, mom? Thank you, mom. Okay, that was awesome. And secondly, I have a feeling that many of us here today, including myself, have an unseen threat that needs our immediate response. What is that unseen threat? Well, I believe it's a danger that many of us will, once it's named, be familiar with, but maybe not understand it to be the threat that it is. And the unseen danger, the unseen threat is hurry being too busy. Our pace of life, I believe, is a radical unseen threat. Here's what Jesus promises. Check this out. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. This is Vision 2020. We're going to do these greater works, and we've looked at this uh, time and again, saying we believe that this is going to be in um, the expression of amazing evangelism, like a ton of people are going to get saved, like we're going to get to baptize 200 people is what we're believing for, and the Lord has just brought people into our midst where we've had the opportunity to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's been awesome. We looked um, also last week at the second portion of this, which is uh, uh, Jesus is telling us that, that, you know, in order to see these these works happen, is that me? I'll just keep going. And Julian, you tell me if I need to grab another mic. But in order to see these works happen, we would have to be asking in the name of Jesus. That, like, right according to to this, uh, look at this next passage here. Uh, Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name. And, and we, we took a look at the fact that like, um, knowing the heart of God is important to accomplishing the works of God. Because Jesus is like, if you ask it in my name, I'll do it. And we looked last week at this idea of well, what does it mean to ask for things in the name of Jesus? And, and we saw it really means asking for things that are, that are like of the character and in the heart of Jesus. 
So it's imperative that you know the person of Jesus in order to ask in his name in order to see the greater works. Oh, I think I keep hitting this thing. Yeah. Julian's like, quit moving around, bro. All right, I'm going to move right here. John Hicks told me I'm not allowed to preach this sermon in a hurry. That's what he told me. So I don't know, I'm not sure what to do now. But I'm going to try because we're doing a series. I didn't touch it. I don't know what happened. I'm busy, and I'm trying not to hurry my way through a message. Okay. I think there's a danger that's... Julian, all right, so what should I do now? An unseen, an unseen threat, that's right. <laughs> should I grab another mic or stay with this one? This one right here. Okay. Should I, should I turn my hip off? It'll do it. Okay. All right. Hey. Hey. Good morning, Avenue Church. When I was nine years old. No, I'm not sorry to go. Right? We're just going to go from here. It's going to be great. But I'm not going to hurry. But I'm not going to hurry. Going at a different pace today. I think there's an unseen threat, uh, danger, if you will, to seeing the, the greater expectations that we have for Vision 2020 as it pertains to the way we're living, as it pertains to our pace of life. Check this out. John Orberg, um, awesome pastor, super smart, really great guy, says this. For many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. We're not just bouncing out. It's that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. That we'll settle for a mediocre version of it. I don't know how you can ask for things in the name of Jesus and pursue the greater works of seeing lost people get saved while living a mediocre faith. I don't know how you can do that. I think it's kind of like impossible, which is why we're trying to identify it as an unseen threat. It's not necessarily the, 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 the flesh of the world, Ortberg says in another place. It's not necessarily um, these, these sins that are going to knock us out. For many of us, it's going to be our busyness to not get close enough in proximity to Jesus in the midst of trying to do these great works that will prevent or at least be a danger to these great works. Ortberg had a mentor in life. His, name's, his name was Dallas Willard. He's gone to be with the Lord. And Ortberg asked Dallas Willard, what do I need to do, basically, in my ministry to kind of like go to the next level or whatever? And this is how Dallas answered him. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Ortberg was waiting for some big, like, answer about anything besides probably this. It said it really took him back. Like, well, what else is there? And it was like, nothing. Just do that. And like, everything will follow. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. This series is based on a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. Uh, many of the themes and the, and the quotes and the, and the chapters of that book you'll see end up uh, over the next uh, weeks as we pursue uh, a new series that I think will be um, potentially, like, like, super powerful to what God wants to do. The name of the series is called Busy, and we're in, we're in uh, message one of Busy. And it's this idea of, um, you know, like, if, if, you want, if you want the greater works, we're going to have to adopt the greater way of Jesus. In your outline, um, it, 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 it'll be helpful for you today, whether you're an outline person or not, to kind of follow along and, and maybe take some notes. You'll see the first blanks there. Um, th this, is, this is where we're headed, and this is where the Spirit is moving us um, over the next uh, uh, weeks. If we desire to experience the greater works, first blank there, promised by Jesus to the church, 
then we will have to engage in the greater way offered by Jesus to the church. Greater works and greater way. If you have your Bibles, um, we're going we're gonna to check out John 14. John 14. And um, we've already been in John 14 as a setup to this uh, particular message and, and series. And I was thinking, well, well, where, you know, like where do we see this? It's like in, in Scripture, where, where is it that, um, you, where, where can we dig, if you will, as we look at a series called Busy and, and the potential of slowing our lives to the pace of Jesus so that he can actually meet us and begin to speak to us and, and form us and, and transform us. And, and what was awesome is God was like, well, you don't need to leave the passage that you've been in like for the last two year to into this year of the vision. Just go back to John 14 and look where it starts. And so if you have your Bibles, that's what we're going to do. Greater works and greater way. So check this out. Jesus beginning in John 14, speaking to his disciples them realizing that he's, he's talking about leaving and things are going to change. And um, you have to imagine yourself being with your Messiah that you've left everything for. And now he's talking about leaving. And so certainly there's like trouble in the air. Their, their hearts are somewhat heavy. Um, they don't know uh, the, the future. And there's, there's uncertainty in their midst. And Jesus addresses that with this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus as uh, the way. The way. The context of this passage has Jesus leaving and going to the Father, and then later promising um, that the greater works that his disciples are going to do are going to be accomplished by the presence of the Holy Spirit working out this great um, kingdom coming move. And as we look at Jesus as the way, it's, it's like um, central to this passage. Jesus as the way. And, and if you've been in, in maybe... Christian circles for a while, or you've grown up in church, you're familiar with Jesus as the way, but what I want to do is explore kind of three different areas of Jesus as the way, and the first one is very central to the passage. He, he's saying that he's going to the Father, and the way to the Father will be through Jesus, and um, we, we would call this, uh, this is like a, a salvation way. Is Jesus is creating a way for us to know the Father, not only because he's dwelt among us and shown us the heart of the Father, but also because he's removing the one barrier that would keep us from the Father, which is sin. So if, if we want to know the Father, we, we have to believe and receive Christ. He would be our way to know the Father. So Jesus is the way of eternal life. He's the way of eternal life. Our sins, according to the scriptures, they separate us from a holy God. Like, there has to be a penalty. There has to be a payment for our sin. And either you pay it, and I pay it, under the penalty and wrath of God for eternity, separated from him in hell, or we receive the payment that has been uh, given on our behalf. God the Son, Jesus Christ, coming and living a perfect life so that he could stand in our place on the cross and receive that payment for our sin that was due you and that was due me. My sin and your sin placed upon Christ and the penalty and price of that sin as well placed upon him. He dies our death and on the third day overcomes it. He beats it. The grave is, is just simply a, a borrowed place. Quoting a, 
a, a, a familiar song. And, and Jesus then says, because I've paid this price, if you will respond to my finished work in faith, then my payment will be credited to you. It's like Jesus takes all of our stuff, right? We've, we, we've all got stuff. He takes it to the cross. He takes our sin, our shame, our lust, our, our infidelity, our abuse, our dishonesty, everything. It's like Jesus takes it on, um, and, and he says, I'm going to take it on as if it were my own, and then I'm going to take the penalty that's due this. Because I love you, and I, I don't want to leave you the way you came in. And he then gives us, through faith and repentance, when a person quits on themselves, it's like, I can't do it. I'm not right. I'm broke. Like, I get it, God. I am a sinner. And I, and I turn from, from trying to save myself. And, I, and I, I turn from my sin and my, sh like, I turn from my life. And I trust what you've done for me. What happens is, is our record goes there. And, and we, over here, we get the perfectly clean record that Jesus took to the cross. We, we trade them. We trade all of that for the cleanliness and the purity and the forgiveness that Christ has to offer in the cross. And then we now live out of this. We now live out of the perfection and the beauty of Christ. And so central to this passage is Jesus inviting Thomas and you and me to receive this by faith. He is the way to his perfect record so that we could know the Father. The one thing has been eliminated, our sin and, and, and the penalty do it. He's also the way to abundant life. Jesus, if, if, if you look in the New Testament, he, he, he makes some amazing promises, and one of the promises that he makes is that he has come that they would have life and they would have it abundantly. Um, again, if you look at your outline, these are, these, are, these are referenced for you. John 10, 10. I have come that they may have life abundantly. And so Jesus promises that when we start living out of this place of forgiveness because of what he's done, we're not only going to survive, we're going to start thriving. We're going to have life abundantly. So not only is Jesus eternal life, like to know God both now and forever, he's also abundant life. And then thirdly, this is where we're going. Because those two things are true, Jesus is also the way to a greater life. Like right now. Right now. He is the way to a, a greater life, a greater rhythm, a greater pace, a greater understanding of the Father now. So, so he is the way for salvation, but he is also a way to live right now. Our reference point for that, and we'll, we'll dig a little deeper in just a minute, is Matthew 11, where Jesus promises, um, come to me, all of you who are burdened and need rest, and, and weary, and I'll, and I'll give you rest. Come to me, and I'll give you something that you can't find on your own. As we spend a little time over the next coming weeks on, on the yoke part of that. Jesus has a yoke for us. He had, that was an agricultural term, and, and it, it would be like um, yoking two animals together. And what Jesus wants to do is yoke you to himself. I love the, the book. I recommend it highly. John Mark Homer goes through this idea of yoking yourself to Jesus so that you would know him, yes, in all these ways, in all these types of life that we just talked about, but primarily what he talks about is so that you would know him as a way of living, almost like a new way to be human as you receive the yoke of Jesus. And what is his yoke? Well, it's gentle, and you're going to find rest. And you won't have to describe yourself as good but busy, hopefully anymore. So what is the way of Jesus? 
What is the way of Jesus? A couple of thoughts. Um, unhurried. Unhurried, but purposeful. Jesus, as you look at his life, was, was unhurried, but he was purposeful. And what I mean by that is he wasn't just like looking for things to do. If you look at the way of Jesus, he had a specific way of living. And it was very purposeful. It was like he was always um, about his, his father's business. And yet, it doesn't seem like Jesus is ever super stressed out about when he's getting up or what's for dinner or, or like um, how he's going to manage and prepare for the Sermon on the Mount. It's like he has this way about him that seems unhurried but purposeful. Like he knows what he's doing. Almost like he's spent so much time with the Father that he's super confident in what the Father wants him to do that he doesn't have to hurry his way through. Jesus, if you look at his life, he, he appears to be unhurried but available. So at the same time he's purposeful, he's very available. You see him oftentimes, uh, it, it's, well, it's not surprising as you look at the New Testament, for Jesus to be walking along, get stopped, and then have time for that individual. Have you ever noticed that? It's like, it seems like Jesus is on his way to this really big healing, and this lesser thing happens, and he's like, oh yeah, hey, I have time for this. Available. He's unhurried, but he, he seems like available to people like you and me, people in need and, and, and people who, who don't seem to maybe always have it all together. And lastly, Jesus seems unhurried but effective. Nobody would look at the life of Jesus and say, epic fail. Like he didn't do enough. He didn't accomplish enough. Man, if he could have only walked on water more. Man, if he could have only um, fed more people. Or man, if he could have only healed a certain, you know, like just more people. It's interesting that Jesus heals some and not others. You ever thought of that? Like there were other sick people. There were other needs that Jesus could have met. But because he was so purposeful about what he was doing and unhurried about it, he knew where he was supposed to go. He knew what he was supposed to do and when he was supposed to do it. And I think a lot of it has to do with this fact that he was unhurried and spent enough time with the Father to know the pace for that particular day and moment. Jesus always did, did what the Father wanted him to do. Well, what about us? Well, what about our way? If you look at your outline there, there's more blanks, I think, that would be helpful to you. The first ones were Jesus unhurried, but purposeful, available, and effective. The second three are us. Are you ready? Okay, so when I say us, I mean, you know, I, like it's, it's not you, it's, it's us, because I'm, I'm with you in this. The way of us. Hurried, but unpurposeful. You ever feel like that? I mean, I feel like I've got some purpose, and like I, 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 I know where I'm going and what I'm trying to do, but sometimes I'm like, you ever get to the end of a day, and you're like, like I'm super exhausted, but I'm not sure I accomplished what I'm supposed to have accomplished today? Or the list, how does the list grow? <laughs> like it starts here, and I, and I crushed it, but now it's like here. I don't know what happened. Um, or, like, was I, was, I supposed to, was I supposed to spend time here or there? Like, like but, I'm, but I'm doing it in a hurry. It's not for lack of working hard. It's just sometimes for lack of working without a distinct heavenly purpose. So Jesus is unhurried, but purposeful. I think sometimes we're hurried, but, but unpurposeful. Like, have we sought the kingdom of God first and foremost in every situation? I mean, that is our purpose, right? If we're living from this space right here of forgiveness and freedom and all the awesomeness that Jesus offers, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And what that means is like in everything, in your work, when you take your kids to the park, when you grab a cup of coffee and read a book, it's all about the kingdom of God. It's all about Jesus always, always, always. No days off. No moments off. It's not like, oh, phew, now I get to have my, like, Travis moment. No, it's now I get to have my Jesus moment, but with a cup of coffee. Now I get to have my Jesus moment, but with my kids or with my, my spouse. 
And so the question is, in the midst of all of your doing, have you always been seeking first the kingdom of God and the person of Jesus in everything, or has that purpose slipped sometimes in order just to get to the next thing? Secondly, we're hurried but unavailable. We're hurried, but, but we don't seem as available as Jesus. So sometimes I'll go to um, subculture, and, and I believe that uh, God wants, he, he like uh, has called me to, to have a presence there, and because I'm filled with the Spirit, and so if I go there, and this is true of you guys, if you go to regular places and establish yourself there, you're establishing the presence of God in a really cool way. That's why it's important to have a faithful presence. We, Tim Keller talks about that. It's part of our strategic framework. It's like go to regular places and realize that you bring the Holy Spirit there in a really special and cool way. You like embody God. It's awesome. So sometimes I'll go to subculture with that um, mindset and I'll be working and then somebody will come up to me. And I'll be like, oh my goodness, I've got work to do. Like, I'm, I'm here, and I'm talking to you, but I'm not really available here because I'm so worried and hurried about everything over here. And so I find myself hurried and at times unavailable when for one of, one of the reasons I go to places like that is to be available. Thirdly, I think the way of us could be described as hurried but ineffective. Hurried but ineffective. Um, I, I don't know what it is. I think, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what you call it. It's just me. And I, I find that I run about 10 minutes late always when my, when my little kids are involved. Now, people cannot do this. I've seen it happen. People can be on time and be super responsible, awesome adults, and show up. I see it like at school dismissal. I've seen people show up and they even seem to like almost be smiling and enjoying the drop off of, of like three kids. I don't know how that happens. I don't know how it happens. Because for me, I just run at this pace that seems to be hurried and ineffective. And it happened again. I was, I was at the park and I thought I left enough time. And can anyone relate before I finish this story? Like, are you, okay. Because I know that those of you who can't are like, what is wrong with this guy? Like, I had 18 kids and I'm always early. You know, like, if that's you, just have a little mercy. I'm, get, I'm, I'm getting this series as I preach it. Um, so I'm running 10 minutes late, and I'm like, but I still had about enough time. I was supposed to pray at 6 o'clock with the IF volunteers, and I got to pick up my son. We're going to go here, and it's cool because my car reflects, I think, some of the pace of— Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going fast. All right, I'm going to sit down and go a little slower. <laughs> my car, I think, sometimes reflects the pace of life at which I live, and it's— Well, you could see it right now. You would know, what I, you would know why I need this series. And so I needed to create a space for my son that I was picking up to take to youth group. All good things, all good things. But um, I was hurried. And so I was cleaning out a space for my son, you know, um, my older son, but the other two were in the car. I was cleaning out a space for my son, and, and you know, I don't want him to sit in this chaos. That's not a good example, right? <laughs> um, and um, in the process, it's like, oh my goodness, we get, we're about ready to go, and, and, and like, I'm kind of, you know how you like, I don't know how, how awesome I was, but you know how like when you're late and you feel that pressure, then you, you like share that pressure with other people? Like, let's go, sucker! Come on! Like, I'm, and so you're, you're usually not in your best way. And anyways, I don't know how I came across, but all I know is life stopped because I couldn't find my phone. So it's like, okay, great. It's like... It's like 10 till 6, and then it's like 6, and then it's like 6.10, and, um, and uh, um, so do you, you want to know where my phone was? Oh, so then I have to involve my wife who's at work, and I'm like, baby, can you do that find my iPhone thing? And she's like, yeah, it's going to take me a second. And so finally I start to hear the ding, ding. How many of you ever lost your phone and needed that? Can anybody relate? Okay, cool, awesome. You need this series too. Um, it's over in the pantry. So I have my ear up to like, like the pantry area. I'm in the pantry area like looking. Is it in the food? Did I get a snack here? Check this out. I threw my phone away. It was in the garbage. So I opened the garbage. I'm like, my phone. Yes. So awesome. 
super, super cool that I found my phone, but because I was in such a hurry and living in such crazy transition, I missed the prayer moment. People had to like stop and rearrange their lives for me. My son got to youth group, but I think he was late. And I realized that I was in a hurry, but ineffective. It's crazy. It's like my hurry, although I believe in it, doesn't actually help my effectiveness. So here's, here's, our, here's our thought. Unseen threats. We want, watch this, we want the works of Jesus without the way of Jesus. That's a threat, guys. Walter Adams, the uh, spiritual director to C.S. Lewis, so if you know C.S. Lewis, this was like his, his guy, says this, to walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. Corey Ten Boom, who hid Jewish families, Christian, uh, grew up in a Christian home that did this, says this. Look, check this quote out. If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. He'll make you busy. So here, here's the deal, right? Vision 2020, greater works. I think we really need to consider as a church family, not just the greater works and be excited about that, but the greater way of Jesus that he offers in his yoke. Hey, check out Matthew 11 with me. Let's just, let's just probably, probably end there. Matthew 11. John, how am I doing on my pace? Am I a little like, less hurried than, okay, thank you. I feel kind of chill. It's okay. I feel okay. Everybody okay with this? Okay. So you can be chill and passionate, I guess, is what I'm trying to learn, okay? So I'm trying to work with this. Okay, so John, um, I mean Matthew 11, 28 through 30. <laughs> Jesus, um, Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me. Let me just pause, because um, huh. I was like, God, I don't know what I'm going to do in this series differently, because I feel busy, but I don't know how to not be busy. So I just want to let you know, like, this is not, oh, man, this is great experience that I now know. This is like, I'm doing this verse, learning from Jesus. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So I woke up two hours later than I wanted to this morning. Not by my choice. My alarm went off, started to get up. I'm like, I have 18 more minutes. I'm going to, like, enjoy them. And I went back to bed, and two hours later, I woke up with, like, this oh my goodness, I know I'm not waking up from my alarm right now. So, something's gone, gone wrong. And into my room came my four-year-old son, Cade. Now, if you know Cade, um, the, f the first two words that come to your mind might not be uh, like cuddle bug. <laughs> it might have something to do with like, like um, fire and passion and like just zeal for life. But in this moment that God forced upon me because he is gentle and kind, my son came and laid on my chest and caressed my fingers and my face and my throat, touched me and felt me and came close to me in ways that are super rare for us right now. And I thought, okay, God, Thank you. Thank you for slowing me enough to have not missed your goodness in that moment. 
And this series is going to be about us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, inviting you to slow enough that we would not miss the moments of God's goodness for us right where we are. Come to me, all you who are weary. I, I, I know that, that there has to be those among us who are weary today. I know that this invitation uh, for some of us is, although it seems far, it's like water for our thirsty soul. And here's what I want to in invite you to. Very simply, the gospel of rest. The gospel of rest. We're about to have communion, and um, communion um, can have different aspects to it, as the gospel can. Gospel means good news. It's what Jesus has accomplished for us through his death and through his resurrection. And as we receive that by faith, then these things become true for us. For those of us who do not receive them, they, they're, they're true. They just don't apply to us. So we remain outside of those things. But, but for those of us who do receive the gospel, the good news that Christ has come and died and rose again, and sinners like myself and like you can be forgiven. Well, that's the gospel of forgiveness. And so if you struggle with forgiveness and, and shame, man, the gospel is for you. Because Christ has fully paid for and cleansed you of everything now and in the future. And he wants to give that to those who will receive it by faith. But then there's the gospel of freedom. I've learned a little bit more about this as I've walked through just uh, a long time of anxiousness. I've learned a, a bit more about the good news of freedom, that Christ hasn't only come to um, forgive my sin, but he's also come to free me from the things that enslave me. That's good news. Today and over these next weeks, we're inviting you into the gospel of rest. The gospel of rest that allows you, because you now live out of this table, clean and pure, to rest in Christ and to put his yoke upon you, which we will look at, practically speaking, in the weeks to come, so that you might find rest. But today, we simply wanted to invite you into that rest. Tim Chester talks about the four G's of the gospel. And the fourth one is one that has been very difficult for my heart to absorb. And it goes like this. God is gracious. Therefore, I don't need to prove myself to myself, to others, or to God. God is gracious in Christ. Therefore, I don't need to prove myself. I can rest. And as I look at my life and all of the things that have brought chaos and struggle and, and even like destruction, if you will, into my life, generally speaking, many of them can be traced to my refusal to rest in Christ. Today as we approach our communion table, we want to invite all of those who are weary and who are tired and who are heavy burdened without having a strategy for it, without having to do three more things to simply come to the person of Jesus not even fully knowing maybe what that all means and just surrender and ask for that rest which he promises to give. It is good news of rest for your souls if you will come. And as we turn our time to communion, the communion table is for those who need rest. The communion table is for those who acknowledge that Christ is where we find our rest. It's for those 
followers of Christ who have put their faith in the finished work of Jesus and today specifically are looking for this moment to encourage them in their journey of rest. If that's not you and you haven't found Christ to be your rest, then communion would not be for you. I just think that this would be a moment to let the song play over you and you to um, be curious and explore the themes of this teaching of Christ's rest. Or if you find your place in a, in a hardened state and you refuse to fight the sin that God has made apparent in your life, then Paul would tell us that this communion moment should pass and really you should invite the Holy Spirit to come and break the hardness of of your heart where, where you've become comfortable with sin. But if you find yourself like me, learning from Jesus and needing him more and more and more, like moment by moment, calling on the name of the Lord, coming to Jesus again and again and again and again, hoping and expecting and beginning maybe little by little to experience that rest that he promises, and even if you're yet to experience, we want to invite you by faith to come and receive communion today, believing that he will meet you and give you that rest that your heart so deeply long for. I'm going to ask our uh, guys to come and uh, prepare our communion elements, and the song will be played over you. You're welcome to ponder the words. You're welcome to sing the words. You're welcome to worship however you might want. And I'm going to leave stage here in just a minute and you'll come up and you'll take, um, and take the bread and you'll take the cup, which remind us of Jesus' body and blood. And then I'll come back and we'll all partake together, believing that he's going to refresh us with his presence and give us the rest that we so deeply need. You may come when you're ready. God as you you do your best work in community and so I'm believing that that might very well be by coming forward and receiving prayer for you as their rest so as we close now in prayer and dismiss we're going to have our prayer partners here we're going to have our worship team here and we're just going to invite you if, if you're one of those weary, longing for rests, we want to invite you to actually physically let, let your action be coming forward to have someone lay hands on you and pray over you and for you and then simply 
rest in what God wants to do in this particular moment. As a matter of details, onboarding class will be beginning directly after in our offices. If you want to be a part of that, we'd love to have you over there. But Jesus, I think we're right now supposed to be in this moment. And so we say, come Holy Spirit, come. Jesus, be who you promised to be. We long for it and look for it both now and forevermore. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. See you next week.